Good morning. So today is the Feast of John of the Cross, December 14th. And I've had the good fortune to have John in my life for, how am I, uh, 37 years about. I I had the opportunity to get to know him early on in, in my mystical life as an adult and have had the blessing of his poetry being an illuminating place for my own path. And today, what we're going to approach is the paradox, because there are so many paradoxes in the spiritual life, of searching and finding, searching and finding. And as I begin the reflection, I'd like you to take just a minute to first pause for a moment and feel into what it's like when you're searching on a really deep soul level, searching for something of God. Uh, maybe it's God in your life in a specific way. Maybe it's simply God in general. So go ahead and take just a moment and feel into that, the search. Feeling into each one of us individually, a moment when we've been searching. What's the texture of the search? What are the descriptors of the, of the search? Descriptors could be feelings, thoughts, colors, climate, temperature, images, what gets evoked when you're reflecting upon search. And now let's transition to when you find or are found. What is the texture of that when you come into an abiding place or a being held place or a, a, a finding, a union place? Take just a moment in the silence and find a few descriptors for yourself of what that's like, feelings, Thoughts, colors, images, climate, temperature. All right. <clears throat> so as we take a look at this paradox, the reason that I, I find it valuable in Advent is that Advent is all of this play of dark and light. And in nature, we have the sun setting earlier and darkness, the feeling of darkness through inclement weather and through less sunshine. And it's a time to not run away from the darkness, but discover something about ourselves and about the divine in the darkness. Discover something. So I want to play a little bit with this paradox of the searching and the finding. For instance, I know that uh, elements that go into both of those for me the finding, the abiding, the discovering, the resting, that evokes feelings of happiness for me. And the search when it's severe, when it's the search for God in a way that uh, there's a need there, <laughs> there's a true need. I find sometimes I have feelings of sadness 
when I'm in the moment of where it seems like there's a gap. And I say seems like because we don't really know. We don't really know. We only have the reflection of our own senses in relation to these things. So these are important and potentially great elements to look towards for ourselves and in ourselves. And Advent gives us a chance to go a little deeper in that contrast. I'm going to read this passage. So we have taken three lines of the of the prayers of the cosmos, our father. And my hope is to get to all of the lines somewhere in the, in Advent. But today I want the passage to be from Luke chapter 11 that comes right after Jesus gives the, our father to his friends when they ask him, you know, teach us to pray because they see Jesus praying and being absorbed. Here's what Jesus has to say. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Now we have an opportunity. Actually, let's just give a pause because that's so juicy, isn't it? It's so juicy. We have an opportunity in those words to explore them. It would be nice to feel the truth of that at all times. And I would imagine, because you're human, and I think all human beings experience this, including me, is that there are moments on very deep soul levels that we are seeking, that we are really asking, and the answer's not there. I would imagine then that butts up against this ask and you will receive. And especially if we're needing to knock on that door shamelessly with great audacity for years, we can begin to wonder, is it true for me? Is it true for me? I want today to be an invitation into the subtlety of what is being said here and the subtlety in which we are called into our path here to penetrate the seeking and the finding or being found, to to be audacious enough to step away from the linear way those words can hit us and to let us be audacious enough to believe it that we knock on the door with such confidence that that itself becomes a place of refuge. I'm going to give you two two, mm, passages that seem to be starkly different. And one's going to be a poem of John of the Cross and one is going to be a psalm. And in John's life, you get this poetry that is so evocative. And within, within all the poems, all of them, 
You've got the search and the find, the search and the find, the search and the find, the longing in the union, the longing in the union, the longing in the union. His life is caught up in a word I'm going to use that I know I use a lot, texture. It's caught up in the texture of this rhythm with the divine. It's a rhythm that you see put so well and probably best put if you're going to look in the Bible in the Song of Songs. Because you get the finding and the loss and the searching and the finding and the letting go and the um, fullness of bliss and the devastation. And you get all of these, all of these pieces revolving around one thing, and that's union with the divine. And John reveals to us that his own path is just simply, he's impelled just about that, just about that. So he paints us a textured picture of what that is like. And because of the amount of detail that he uses, we can get intimate with him and intimate with our own journeys. When we stand outside of the statement, ask and you shall receive, we remain on the outside, but we, we let whatever is happening pull us more deeply by virtue of that phrase to ourselves, we discover something new. And I believe, at least my own journey to this point, is that I believe we discover presence, even in the loss, even in the absence but it's very subtle and it takes us having an audacity and a willingness to go there. It takes us. And, and I love the phrase, the way it's translated in the parable that's recorded to Jesus said, shameless audacity, shameless audacity. Now that's confidence to knock on the door that much, you know, here his friend has turned him away. And it's really late at night. And you you would think culturally that it would be most charitable to give up. But Jesus is saying, no, don't give up. Don't give up. Be undaunted. And that is a quality that we see so often in children. How often even children, when they feel confident and secure, will butt up against something if they're not getting something they want. Come on, please, 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 right? We have the chance to recover that kind of childlike audacity within ourselves that's not cut up, um, put up, that's not caught up in protocol, in, in a certain pomp, in a certain pretense, shameless audacity. And John had that. So let me, let me read for you a little bit of these two passages. First of John's poem. Now, I would like to read the whole poem. We don't have the time to do that in our morning meditation. But in his spiritual canticle, he starts out with this phrase, where have you hidden yourself and abandoned me in my groaning, O oh my beloved? You have fled like the heart, having wounded me. I ran after you crying, but you were gone. In search of my love, I will go over mountains and strands. I will gather no flowers. I will fear no wild beasts and pass by the mighty and the frontiers. That's pretty audacious. And of course, the spiritual canticle goes on, goes on. But in this, in this, and what I want to point to there as a, as a portal to us today is there's texture in the words. 
there's not this abstract approach to God. It's very sense oriented. And it, it says to me, is not each one of our paths meant to be that sense oriented? Why? So that we can, we can experience the, the hidden gems that are involved in the longing, the search, and the loss, and the being found. A thousand graces diffusing, he passed through the groves in haste, and merely regarding as he passed, clothed them with his beauty. Oh, who can heal me? See, he's getting the fragrance even along his search. And I think there's great consolation there for us that even in moments of darkness, there is a fragrance happening, <clears throat> not outside of creation, but through creation and through ourselves. Here we have counterpointed to that Psalm 139. And this is a moment of, of real abiding. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? And further down, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as day, for darkness is as light with you. I believe we have here in the psalm He's able to give, he, she is able to give utterance to these words. And the unspoken part is the knowing he, she is beloved. The audacity to say with such precision what is said in Psalm 139 comes from not just being searched and known, but being beheld and beloved, beheld and beloved. That, that we experience when we get into the texture of where we are in this present moment in our relationship to the divine. And that is at each and every moment, the texture of that moment. So today's meditation practice, if you will, is going to be something of Alexio Divina. And I know that the most powerful way to do that is if we were in person together and we were sitting in a circle and one of us read a passage and we bubbled up afterwards and tossed words that hit us into the circle as light bursts. So this is a little bit solitary, the need to do it this way. But in honor of John, who, who is so loving and so penetrating, I'd like to do a very slow meditative read of the entire spiritual canticle. And what I'd like to invite you to do is rest into the silence with me and let the words impregnate and notice when a word stirs you. Now, if you have a pen and paper, you could write it down. And I'd like to invite you, if you can, sometime today, sit again with this phrase and let the texture of the phrase come out for you. Let the texture reveal to you what of spirit is moving. In the newsletter, I'm going to uh, put a link to this translation. Uh, there's other translations that I like very much, but this one's really nice. And I, this might be very close to the translation I like best. So it's not quite the best translation it, for me, but it's a very good one. 
So let's go ahead and settle in for this lovely, lovely canticle. And when you're ready, close your eyes. You are here. You are here and there is something very divine about your being here. Where two or three are gathered in the name, there the ineffable is present. So allow these words to wash upon you. And as they wash upon you, as they wash upon you, just notice what stirs. It could be a word, it could be a phrase. What stirs, because that, that is your beloved saying, here's where I am. Here's where you are. Here is where we meet. And I recognize and invite John, John of the Cross, to be present with us with all his wisdom and gentleness and audacity. You begin. Let yourself breathe and be here. Where have you hidden yourself and abandoned me in my groaning, oh my beloved? You have fled like the heart, having wanted me. I ran after you, crying, but you were gone. O oh, shepherds, you who go through the sheep cots up the hill, if you see him whom I love the most, tell him I languish, suffer, and die. In search of my love, I will go over mountains and strands. I will gather no flowers. I will fear no wild beasts and pass by the mighty and the frontiers. O oh, groves and thickets planted by the hand of the beloved. O oh, verdant meads enameled with flowers. Tell me, has he passed by you? A thousand graces diffusing, he passed through the groves in haste and merely regarded them as he passed, clothed them with his beauty. Oh, who can heal me? Give me at once yourself. Send me no more a messenger who cannot tell me what I wish. All they who serve are telling me of your unnumbered graces and all wound me more and more and something leaves me dying. I know not what of which they are darkly speaking. But how you persevere, O life, not living where you live. The arrows bring death, which you receive from your conceptions of the beloved. Why, after wounding this heart, have you not healed it? And why, after stealing it, have you thus abandoned it and not carried away the stolen prey? Quench my troubles. 
for no one else can soothe them. And let my eyes behold you, for you are their light, and I will keep them for you alone. Reveal your presence and let the vision and your beauty kill me. Behold, the malady of love is incurable, except in your presence and before your face. O oh, crystal well, O oh, that on your silvered surface you would mirror forth at once those eyes desired which are outlined in my heart. Turn them away, O oh my beloved, I am on the wing. Return, my dove. The wounded heart looms on the hill in the air of your flight and is refreshed. My beloved is the mountains, the solitary wooded valleys, the strange islands, the roaring turrets, the whisper of the aberrant gales, the tranquil night at the approaches of the dawn, the silent music, the murmuring solitude, the supper which revives and enkindles love. Catch us, the foxes, for our vineyard has flourished, while of roses we make a nosegay and let no one appear on the hill. O oh, killing north wind, cease. Come, south wind that awakens love. Blow through my garden and let its odors flow, and the beloved shall feed among the flowers. O oh, nymphs of Judea, while amid the flowers and the rose trees, the amber sends forth its perfume, Tarry in the suburbs and touch not our thresholds. Hide yourself, O oh my beloved. Turn your face to the mountains. Do not speak, but regard the companions of her who is traveling amidst strange islands. Light winged birds. Lions, fawns, bounding does, mountains, valleys, strands, waters, winds, heat, and the terrors that keep watch by night. By the soft lyres and the siren strains, I adjure you, let your fury cease and touch not the wall that the bride may sleep in greater security. The bride has entered the pleasant and desirable garden, and there reposes to her heart's content, her neck reclining on the sweet arms of the beloved. Beneath the apple tree, there you were betrothed. There I gave you my hand, and you were redeemed where your mother was corrupted. Our bed is of flowers, by dens of lions encompassed, hung with purple, made in peace, and crowned with a thousand shields of gold. In your footsteps, the young ones run your way. At the touch of the fire and by the spiced wine, the divine balsam flows. In the inner cellar of my beloved have I drunk. And when I went forth over all the plain, I knew nothing and lost the flock I followed before. We sit in a moment of silence. When you're ready, 
I invite you to open your eyes. That was not the entire poem. So my hope is that you'll spend time today and click the link and slowly move through these words. Texture is a teacher. The fibers of creation. Breathe the beloved. Let today be a day of that exploration with John, who went there so audaciously. Blessings, my friends. Have a wonderful day.